Hey guys, it's Friday, so of course that means it is the perfect day to talk about shortest path algorithms for graphs. And today we're going to be talking about the Bellman Ford algorithm. We're just going to run through the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it mechanically, really quickly, get you to understand how it works, why it works, and how it does what it does. And then we'll prove some facts about it really briefly. And then in a following video, we'll do a practical example and work through that together. We'll, we'll run it through. So what does it do? Well, it's really similar to Dijkstra's in that it takes in a source vertex and computes from that source vertex the shortest path in a weighted graph to every other vertex. So it's a handy a handy algorithm. The difference between this algorithm and Dijkstra's is that Bellman Ford can handle negative weight cycles. So if you have a graph that you know has negative edge weights and you're not sure if there's a negative weight cycle, you use Bellman Ford. If you know you don't have any, use Dijkstra's because Dijkstra's is faster. Bellman Ford, as we'll see, is much slower. But how does it do what it does? Well, it runs on the backbone of this procedure right here called relax, which takes in a vertex U, a vertex V, and the connecting edge weight. So it takes in U, V, and the weight of the interceding edge. That's all. And using that, it checks to see if the distance to V that we already have recorded, so it checks in a distance array that you're keeping updated with every iteration of the algorithm. It checks in distance array to see if the distance that you already have recorded to V, so the, 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 the weight of your current proposed shortest path, if you think of it that way, is bigger than if you were to go to V from U instead, essentially. And you compute that by saying, if it's bigger than the distance to U plus the weight of this edge. So if you got to U from somewhere else in the graph, doesn't matter, you got to U and then you went to V, is that distance shorter than the distance you already have recorded? In the event it is, you just set that distance to the new distance, and you set V's new previous in your previous array, so the preceding node to get to V, you set that to U. And the previous array is not a requirement for Bellman Ford. You could run Bellman Ford without it. It would still be Bellman Ford. This is just adds a utility function, essentially. It allows you to print out the physical shortest path. You can actually say, oh, well, you go to this node, then this one, then this one, then this one, and then you get to your destination. As opposed to what Bellman Ford normally does, which is just prints out the shortest paths. It says, oh, well, this is a total weight X, total weight Y, total weight C, and all that. This is more useful. It's an important concept. So, how does it actually use this procedure? Well, we have pseudocode. Don't try to run this. It's mostly just the logic. In the beginning, what we do is we take the our distance array. We set the distance of our source vertex S to zero, and the distance of every other vertex in the set of vertices. So for all all U and V. The distance of u is set to infinity. And that's just because we haven't looked at them yet, so we don't know. So as far as we know, they're indefinitely far away from s. And then, v minus 1 times, we're going to iterate through every edge. And we iterate through v minus 1 times, and we, uh, well, there's a reason for that. We'll get there. We're going to relax every edge. And we're going to do that v minus 1 times. Now the reason we're doing it v minus 1 times is pretty intuitive, actually. If you think about a graph, like a really simple one, obviously there are, you have three vertices, you've got two edges connecting them. So you've got v minus 1 edges. If you computed the shortest path from, say, your s to t here, if this is s, this is t, then you're going to have, let's say this is V, then you have S to V, V to T. Those would be the edges in your shortest path. You'd have two edges, you'd have V minus one edges. But what if you've got a more complicated graph that has like five vertices that connect haphazardly like this? 
any number of edges you like, all the way up to v squared. Then the shortest path is still only going to contain v minus 1 edges. It has to. So if you think about it, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Do, do, do. Let's say that this is s and this is t. And we have s and we have t. The shortest path is going to contain four edges, because it must. If it contains more than four edges, any, even one more than four edges, then what do you get? You get something like that. A cycle. So, how is that useful to us in computing a shortest path? Like, that, that doesn't even make sense. How is this the shortest path from S to T if you suddenly, for some reason, you're going back, or you have... You know, you know what, what is the purpose of this? So, it's always going to be V minus 1. You're going to do V minus 1 iterations, relaxing at every edge, and that should, once you've completed the V minus 1 iterations, that should give you shortest paths to every node. But what if you have a negative weight cycle that you haven't noticed yet? That's where the genius of Bellman Ford comes in. It runs relax one more time on every edge. So for all E in E, for every edge, we're just going to run this little check from relax again. And in the event we find that we can shorten any of the paths further than we already have, that means we have, we must have, a negative weight cycle. If you have a negative weight cycle, it's going to look something like this. Say your graph has something like this going on in it, and you know, you can, maybe there's more to the graph down here, but the point is that this is here. And you've got, maybe this is 4, 2, and negative 7 for edge weights. Then you have if you say you want to go, you know, here you've got 4, you've got 6, negative 1, da, da, negative 2, da, da, negative 3, and it's just going to keep on going until you get to negative infinity, you're just going to go indefinitely, negative infinity. So, it's impossible to really effectively compute a shortest path if you've got a negative cycle in the graph, that's why we have to check. And if we find that we can continue to reduce the length of a path after v minus 1 iterations, then that's what's going on. So we know we have a negative cycle. In that case, we would just return false. The algorithm will exit and probably print an error message saying you have a negative cycle in your graph, you can't work with this. If, however, we go all the way through, line 8, we just return true, and then at that point we can start printing out our, our previous array and give all the paths and the path lengths and be useful. Even the failure is useful. So yeah, lines 2 through 4 actually do the relax and compute the shortest paths. Lines 5 through 8, check for a negative cycle. That's what's going on. If you want to find the actual code that's eminently Googleable, just go for it. So how long does it take? Well, that is also pretty intuitive. You're iterating over every edge v minus 1 times, right? Which in asymptotic notation is the same thing as saying e times v. But what do we know about the cardinality of E, about the set of edges? Well, if you've ever programmed a graphing algorithm before, then you know that graphs are often represented as matrices. So if you think about it like that, say you've got your matrix here, and all your nodes listed going across and down. You so say you've got A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, going all the way across, and each cell represents an edge, in the worst case, all of these cells are full. So there's an edge between every node and itself, is the worst case. Which means that the upper bound of E is technically V squared. So if you look a little further, what we're actually working with in terms of complexity for this algorithm and why you should only use it when you absolutely need to is that it is of complexity v cubed. So it's a giant lumbering algorithm, but it does solve a difficult problem, and that's negative edge weights. 
and uncertainty about negative cycles. So yeah, in the next video, we'll do an example. We'll run through it. We'll see how it works. We'll try to throw a negative cycle in there and see if we can catch it. So maybe we'll do two examples. Um, yeah, have an awesome Friday.